All right, well, we're there. Proverbs chapter number 26. Um, look down, if you will, at verse number 2 there. Proverbs 26, verse number 2. It's kind of going to be our main verse for the sermon uh, this evening. It says, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. So this verse, like a lot of verses in the book of Proverbs, it's using a comparison here. And the comparison it's using is, is saying, as, a bird by, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. So it's saying when you see a bird flying around or walking around, uh, it's not a really complicated um, example it's trying to use here, but it's doing something. There's a reason the bird's flying around. Maybe it's looking for food. Maybe it's going somewhere. Maybe someone scared it off and it's flying away. But what the comparison the verse is trying to use, it's saying in that same way as when you see a bird or any animal going somewhere, it's for a reason, so the curse causeless shall not come. The idea is that there's a purpose. And in the same way, what it's saying is that when hard times or hardships or problems, struggles, however you want to say it, happen in our lives, there's a reason it comes. This says the curse causeless shall not come. That means no bad time is going to come in your life without a cause. Right? And so what I'd like to do tonight, the title of the sermon is The Curses Cause. And I'd like to go over just some reasons that the Bible gives for curses in our lives. Because I, I, don't, I don't know exactly if, there's a, if you're going through a hard time in your life right now, I don't exactly know why that is in your life, but the Bible does give us reasons that we can apply, and with help of the Holy Spirit, we can find out why it's happening in our life. All right? So I'd like to look at some reasons for curses in our lives and how we respond to each of them. So let's just get right into it tonight. First tonight, the curses caused may be testing from God. Turn to Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. It may be here tonight and you say, well, I'm not going through a hard time right now. My life's great. I, you know, I'm, everything's going great for me. Well, I do know this. If you're not going through a hard time right now, you will in the future. The, so you've probably heard this before, but the Christian life is a series of ups and downs, right? If you're not going through a hard time now, you will in the future. So this sermon does, does apply to everybody. You're there in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Look down at verse number 1. So the Bible says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. You say, why did God lead them in the wilderness? Obviously, you know, a lot of everybody knows about uh, the children of Israel. They wandered in the desert for forty years. You say, why did God do that to them? Well, the first reason is he was testing them. Let's look at the rest of the verse. He says, to humble thee and to prove thee. We're going to look at a lot of verses that have that phrase in there where God's talking about proving people or testing people. To humble thee, and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. Why? That he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. One reason that God was leading them in through to wander in the wilderness was he was testing them. He wanted to know what was in their heart. Again, verse 2, he said to humble thee, to prove thee. This is why God did that. But how does God test us, right? If God's going to test us in our life, how is he going to go about doing that? Turn to Psalm 17, 8. Psalm 17, verse 8. The main reason that I think God can test us is he can test us by bad times. And this is kind of the idea of the sermon, right? It's the curses cause, right? Why do bad times happen in our life? God tests people by bad times. That's a, it's a theme we see a lot in the Bible. You're there in Psalm 17, verse 8. The Bible says, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth, mouth they speak proudly. They have compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth. Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Let's just pause here. Obviously, David's going through a very hard time right now, right? Just how he's describing his life. He's saying, I'm just being oppressed. People, uh, wicked people are around me. He's not going through a good time right now. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. 
from men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of this world, which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So why, right? Obviously, it's a very hard time David's going through right now. This is a lot of Psalms in the book of Psalms are like this, but you say, why? Why was he going through this time? Well, look at verse one, same chapter, verse number one, Psalm 17, one. Here's one reason that the chapter tells us, hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of faint lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me. See these phrases that we keep seeing? And shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. God was testing David. God wanted to know, and God does the same thing with us. God wants to know why we do what we do. Pastor Men is something he says a lot is motives matter, right? Because it's not just enough that you serve God or that you go to church or that you go soul winning. God sometimes wants to know why you do what you do, right? Maybe God is testing us. Maybe God wants to know what is in our heart. Turn to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, 17. While you're turning to Psalm 105, I'm going to read you some verses from Job 23. Basically, we don't have time to go over the whole thing, but the story of Job in 30 seconds is Job was a righteous man, the Bible says. He served God. He feared God. Satan goes to God and says, oh, God, he only serves you because he's rich. He only serves you because he's blessed. He only serves you because you've given him anything he could ever want. And God said, well, let's find out. So he tested Job. He, Job lost everything but his own life. He lost his own health. He lost his children, his family, everything he, he owns. God took it all from him. In Job, in, in Job 23, verse 8, he's talking about God and uh, talking about how alone he feels. He says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. He says, I don't know where God is. I don't know why he's doing this. I don't know what the reason is for, for why this is happening. But verse 10, he said, but he knoweth. He's saying, here's what I do know, God knows. But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth is gold. And Job ended up finding out later in the, the story that God was trying him. God just wanted to know, you know, is your, are your riches, is, is the state of your life dependent on how much you serve God? And that's exactly what God was doing to Job. You're there in Psalm 105, we're talking about Joseph. One thing I like about the book of Psalms is you'll kind of see these uh, Psalms where it'll just kind of recap a story of something that happened Elsewhere in the Old Testament, it kind of gives us more insight on what happened. Verse 17 says, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters, who was laid in iron. And so of course, referring to the fact that he was put in prison for something he did not do. Until the time that his word came, don't miss this, the word of the Lord tried him. You say, why, why in the world would God test me by making my life harder, right? Wouldn't I want to serve God the better my life is? Why would he, if, if God expects me to run the Christian race and serve him, why would he put a stumbling block in front of me? Why would he try to slow me down? What, why in the world would God do that? Because God knows that there's this uh, trend among some people where the harder their life gets, the less they serve God. Somehow they get this idea that, you know, it's harder for me so God doesn't expect me to do it or, or they, they give up whatever it is, maybe God just wants to make sure that's not you, right? And maybe God is closely observing you. You say, I'm going through a trial in my life right now, or, you know, I know one day I will. Why is he doing it? Well, one cause of a curse in your life may be that God is testing you. And if you are going through a hard time in your life, you should realize that God is watching you. He's observing you right now. And he's watching you to see whether you're going to quit, or you're going to keep going. Maybe you're not going to quit, but you're just going to slow down. God wants to make sure that's not you. Turn to Psalm 66. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. He's saying, they know who I am and they say my name and, and they have a sense of spirituality. If you would have a conversation with them, it'd seem like they're real spiritual. But he said, their heart is far from me. 
It's possible to have a sense of spirituality about you and, and claim to serve God and even with your actions a little bit serve God, but your heart can be far from God. And maybe you don't even know it, but whereas if something would happen in your life and if things would get harder, maybe you'd back off, right? Some people, when things get harder, they don't quit, right? Because they, that would be too obvious to them, but they kind of subconsciously back off. Right? And they slow down, and it, and it kind of makes it, as things get harder, they serve God less. And there in Psalm 66, verse 11, it says this, Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou layest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. Obviously, that's not literal, but if you're saying people are riding over your head, things are not going well for you, right? And uh, keep reading, it says, We went through fire and through water. But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. You say, why? What, what was in, in the case of these people, what was the curse's cause? Look at verse 10. I, the Bible gives us the answer in every single one of these situations. For thou, O Lord, hast proved us. Same thing. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Do you see the theme here? You don't ever hear about somebody in the Bible just, th their life's a mess, it's a, they're, they're, there's a curse they're going through, they're going through a hardship, and there's just no reason. It just happened. Right? The reason God, one of the reasons, we're going to look at all of them tonight, but one of the reasons that trials can happen in our lives is because God is testing us. He's watching us. Yep. He's watching you. Every curse happens for a reason. That's kind of the main idea of the sermon tonight. You don't have to turn there. But 1 Peter 1, 6, this is one of my, some of my favorite verses, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You say, things, it's, I'm going through heaviness right now. Why? Verse 7 says, That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's where the, the hymn came from that we sang this morning. It, I love that phrase because you know what you should realize, you know, it, it, take that as a time. If you know you're going through a hard time in your life, you need to realize, you know what, my faith's on trial. Right? We talked about faith this morning, right? Your faith, God sometimes wants to try your faith. Right? He wants to see how you're going to react to certain things. But before we move on, obviously the, you can go back to Deuteronomy 8. Obviously the, the main idea of the sermon is, is the curse is caused, right? But while we're talking about this, while we're talking about God testing us, I want to look at the other way God tests people. Because sometimes we get this idea that you know, the only way God tests us is by making things harder, right? But there's another theme in the Bible where God can test people, not just by bad times, but by good times. Sometimes God can test you by blessing you. And they're in Deuteronomy 8. So we're going to read a, uh, read a lot of verses here, but pay attention, okay? There's a theme that God's trying to get across here, all right? And I don't, I don't want you to miss it. Deuteronomy 8, let's keep reading in verse 7, says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of, of oil, olive, and honey. Sounds like paradise to me. Sounds like things are going great for them. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. He's saying you're going to have plenty of food. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. In a, a, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass, when thou hast eaten and art full. He's saying when your life is going great, then, th then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he giveth thee. Beware. Beware. Say, I, I, I have a great job. I have money in the bank. My life is awesome. What do I have to beware about? I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Everything's great. I am, my life is amazing. Well, let's, let's keep reading. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Why in the world would I forget God when he blesses me? Wouldn't it be the opposite? He blesses me and I, you know, I, I become a better Christian. Here's why. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, when he says when you have everything you could have ever dreamed, dreamed of, 
and has built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, here's how. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, wherein was no water, who brought thee forth out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. See how he's pointing out the fact that everything you have is from me? He's pointing out that you forgot everything I, 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 I took you through. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth? You know, God must be so frustrated with people. He says, you know, you messed up, you failed, you're a sinner, you deserve to go to hell. So I sent my son, who was perfect, he never did anything wrong, to die for your sorry self, to pay for your sins, to stand in your place. And after that, I still blessed you, I still gave you more, I still, I still give you everything you ever wanted. And now, you're so arrogant and lifted up, you serve me less than if I never blessed you to begin with. Amen. Talk about stabbing God in the back. And, you know, it's, it's more rare that people just stop serving God altogether when, when hard times come or when blessings come, but the trend is to slow down, right? Because the devil knows that, you know, we, we're going to, we'll subconsciously just back off, right? We can stop serving God less you know, you'll, you'll forget to read your Bible tomorrow, tomorrow without even notice, noticing it, right? He, he, he knows that people get backslidden gradually. We need to remember that, well, verse 18, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Beware. Look, are you blessed in this life? Praise God. But just realize, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. That's right. right? God requires the more from you, the more he's given you, not less. Right? Turn, turn to Deuteronomy, uh, stay in Deuteronomy 8, but turn to, turn to Genesis 32. I didn't originally have this in my notes, but I was reading this today. I thought it'd be good to go to. Stay in Deuteronomy 8. We're going to come back. Just go to Genesis 32. So the story in Genesis 32 is, so Jacob had uh, fled from Esau, he was with Laban for 20 years, and now he's going back home, right? He's going back home, and at this time he's kind of praying to God, he's, he's worried, he's afraid of Esau. Um, if you remember, when, when Jacob left, Esau was ready to kill him. A Esau was saying, wait, I'm just going to wait for my father Isaac to die, and then I'm going to kill Jacob. So Jacob's obviously pretty afraid. He you know, has this idea that he's just been boiling in his anger for these 20 years. And, but you know, when Jacob left, Jacob, Jacob left his family with nothing, but when he came back, he was actually very blessed. He had, he had a family, he had tons of uh, herds, he, he, he had gained a lot. Look at verse 10, Genesis 32, 10. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He's saying, when I, 20 years ago, it was just me and my staff. It was just me and my stick. That's all I had. I had a stick. And now I'm coming back, and, and you know, look how much you've blessed me. But the idea he's trying to make is he says, I wasn't worthy of your blessing when it was just me and my stick. Much less when I'm blessed now. And this is the idea that we need to have, that, you know what? We need to realize that even if, whether we have a stick or whether God's just blessed us abundantly, you know, we're not worthy of the least of it. Amen. Right? And it's ironic because, you know, we all, we all, I love this phrase where it's like, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. But yet, when we have lots of mercies, that's when people serve God less. And that's the tendency we want to follow, right? We need to make sure we don't slip into that. Don't let what God has given you stand between Him and stand between you and Him, right? How ironic is that? God gives you something, and then that's the reason you don't do His will, right? So first tonight, I said the curse's cause may be testing from God, right? We looked at a couple ways that God tests people. But second tonight, go back to Deuteronomy 8. You should have kept your place there. The curse's cause may be correction from God. 
maybe correction from God. What, why else did God lead, lead them through the wilderness for 40 years? It wasn't just to test them. That was obviously a reason we saw, but it wasn't the only reason. Uh, look at verse 2. We're, we're going to reread a couple verses here. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So that's what we just looked at, right? The testing. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Look, notice verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Turn to Numbers 14. Numbers 14. So this was the other reason God tested them. He was chastising them. You say, for what? Well, you're there in Numbers 14. It's going to feel like we're kind of jumping in the middle of the story, but if we wanted to get the full context, we'd have to read like three chapters, and I don't want to do that to anybody. So uh, Numbers 14, look at verse 32. Numbers 14, 32. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. So really long, long story short, here's what happened. So they came, they were nearing the promised land. God sent 12 spies to search out the land. They came back and 10 out of the 12 lacked faith. They didn't think that God would be able to do it. They were afraid with what they saw. And I guess you could say that they, they forgot that the Lord is able to give them much more than this, right? They forgot that God fights our battles. You know, if our, if our battles we fight were up to us, we'd lose all of them, right? And that's the idea. They forgot that it was up to God and they, they lacked that faith. So they go back and they tell everybody we're all going to die. Everybody freaks out. They want to stone, stone Caleb and, jo uh, and Joshua. And God decides to destroy them for their sin. Moses decides to intercede again. He says, God, don't destroy them. You know, I know, I know they're bad, but just have mercy on them. He intercedes for them again, and probably for the millionth time, ends up saving their life. God has mercy. You know, I think it's funny. People read the Old Testament, and a lot of atheists will kind of like use the Old Testament to show how violent God is, and how mean God is, and how God's so evil. Anybody who's read the Old Testament will understand that the Old Testament, it's a story of mercy, yeah. not wrath. Right? Because you know what? Every time God said, I'm going to go destroy them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill everybody, they deserve to die. Because right. God decided. And you read what they did. They did deserve that. But you know what? Moses, you know what? God is still merciful. Right? If, if we were God, the, the, the Old Testament would be five, five books long. We'd, we'd, we'd be, end up probably killing everybody by the third, by the third book. Right? And this is what people forget. It's a story of a God who, yes, because he loves them, is going to judge them in the end, but it, he showed them mercy and mercy and mercy and gave them chance after chance after chance. Right? But anyway, Moses intercedes and God spares them and he decides to give them another punishment instead. Verse 33, And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness, after the number of the days which ye search the land, even forty days each day for a year, shall ye bury your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it to all this evil congregation. Do you realize that? Do you realize that they were evil? You know, when you're reading, if you ever get this idea, man, God's so mean, they were evil. Read what they did. Read what they did over and over and over that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So they were going to wander the wilderness for 40 years, each day for a year. So every day that the spies uh, sent, uh, spent walk going, searching out the land, every day for a year was how long they had to wander. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord. So those the actual spies that brought up the evil report, God just killed them right away. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search out the land, lived still. So Caleb and Joshua, they were the, they were the men that actually interceded and said, no, God, you know, they had the faith. God did not kill them, of course. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned 
greatly. All that just for a lack of faith. But the idea is that the reason, right, we're reading Deuteronomy 8 and how God sent them through the wilderness. The, one of the reasons was because he was punishing them for their sin. Turn, to, turn back to Proverbs 26 too. Proverbs 26 too. So yes, the curse is caused and may just be God testing us, right? It may just be uh, God wanting to see what's in our heart. Maybe God just wants to test us. But do not be in denial of the fact that God may be punishing us for our sin, right? We need to look at our own lives and just be honest with ourselves. But maybe God's trying to get your attention on something. There are Proverbs... Uh, while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you Proverbs 3.12. It says this, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son whom he delighteth. You know the, the song, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, this I know. If Jesus loves you, that means he's going to punish you. Yep. Right? Think about that. that. Remind yourself of that, right? That's what that, that, that's, if Jesus loves you, whom the Lord loveth. Jesus loves all of us. That means he's not afraid to punish us when we mess up. Right? right? Uh, you're there in Proverbs 26 too. The Bible says this, As the bird by wandering is a swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. But notice the connection in the next verse. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Turn to Leviticus 26. Maybe the curse in your life is a spiritual rod God is using to try to wake you up a little bit. Right? He's trying to get your attention a little bit. Leviticus 26 Look at verse number 3, Leviticus 26, verse number 3. It says, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments to do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall, shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. And I will give, you, and I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid, and I will ride evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land, and you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. The blessings just go on and on, right? He's saying, hey, if you serve me, and if you don't depart from my commandments, here's what I'll do to you, right? I'm going to bless you, I'm going to give you all these things. Look, skip down to verse 14. Because remember, the title of the sermon is not the blessings cause, it's the curses cause, right? Verse 14 says, But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, uh-oh, here we go, and if you shall despise my judgments, and if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning ague that shall consume your eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it, and I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. He's saying people are going to hate you, you're going to die, you're going to be diseased. It just, it just goes on and on. I will set my face against you, you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. He's saying you're going to be running scared when no one's even chasing you. And if you will not if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Let's skip to verse 21. We don't even have time to read all the curses. And if you will walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, here it is again, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your, what's that word? Sins, right? I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me, by all these things. He's saying, if you can't figure out that I'm actually trying to get your attention and punish you, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. He's saying, you better get reformed, you better get right, or what? Just look at the rest of the chapter. We don't even have time to read it all. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. For those of you who know this chapter, do not worry. We're not going to read the whole thing. We'd be here for hours. Deuteronomy 28. Start at the beginning of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the Bible there. 
Deuteronomy 28. I want everyone to get there. We're not going to read anything in it, but I just want to point something out about this chapter. All right, so you're there. Look at verses. Just You have your Bible there. Look at verses number 1 through 14. So those are all the blessings, right? Those are all the blessings for if you serve God and you know if, if you follow my commandments, so I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to do that for you. Those are all the blessings that God has to offer for serving him. Okay, now look at the whole rest of the chapter. Verses 15 through 68. That's a lot bigger of a section, isn't it? Those are all the curses God has to offer. You get the idea? Turn to Nehemiah 9. I just... This wasn't in my notes, but... Nehemiah 9. Those are all the curses, because the curses are much more. Do you see the comparison there? That verses 1 through 14 was like this, and then verses 15 through 68 is like this. That's the idea God's trying to make. Turn to Nehemiah 9. I need to turn to Nehemiah 9, because I just want to point out that, you know, the idea, when God punishes you for your sin, it's not just so he can wipe you out and kill you, and then he doesn't have to worry about you anymore. The idea of him punishing you is because he wants you to get right. God wants you to live a successful, happy life. He wants to bless you, but sometimes he just needs to correct you a little bit, right? Sometimes he needs to kind of bring you back down to earth, right? And there in Nehemiah 9, um, look at verse number... Look at verse number 17. So they're talking about uh, just the children of Israel, right? Which ironically is what we're reading about. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. Uh, bondage. So they're talking about how rebellious they were, right? And obviously we know that God punished them for that. But notice the other part of this verse. But thou art a God ready to pardon gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. God, the, the idea is that God's ready to pardon. He wants you to get right so he can just pardon you and you can move on. That's the idea. Verse, uh, the next verse there says, Yet thou in thy manifold mercy. See, that's the theme of the Old Testament. It's mercy. It's not wrath and um, um, some mean God that just wants to kill people. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not. Look at verse 27. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies, who vex them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, see that, that term is mercy, manifold mercy, ready to pardon, merciful. Thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Right? And then ironically, if you read the rest of the chapter, it's exactly what I was talking about. It's just how they kept turning against God and turning against God but he still had mercy. Turn to Joshua chapter 7. We just need to realize that we're very much accountable to God for how we live our life right now, yep. right? For both the wrong things we do and the things we should do that we don't, right? For the things that God expects of us that we don't do. We're accountable to God for all that, right? Whether it's something we should, that he's commanding us to do or don't do, we're accountable to God for everything that's in this book, Amen. right? Amen. So, we're looking at what's the curses cause in our life, right? Or if curses do eventually come in our life, what's the reason for that, right? First, I said the curses cause may be testing from God. Second, I said the curses cause may be correction from God. Third, tonight, the curses cause may be a result of someone else's sin. And this part isn't really to the person who's being affected by someone else's sin. It's just kind of to get across to you that your sin, not only can God correct you for your sin, but other people are going to face the consequences of that as well. There in Joshua chapter 7, this is a, just a story here. So the context is in chapter 6, they just, uh, it's a famous story where they went to Jericho. And they, they defeated Jericho and they had their, really their first great victory in, in, um, in the promised land. Verse 2, uh, let's start reading verse number 2. The Bible says, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. So the Ai is like this next city that they're going to, they're going to invade. Because God, God didn't tell them just to take people captive or, you know, to... He, he, God wanted everybody dead. He wanted everything burned. He wanted everything down to the ground, burned to the ground. They were so evil, God said, I, I, don't, I don't want a single person left. Right? That's the idea where, if you remember in, in 1 Samuel, when Saul was commanded to kill the Amalekites, and, and Saul went and he killed people, and, but they spared people. And, and the, the king, the king of the Amalekites, right, uh, they, he, Saul saved alive, right? And maybe Saul felt bad for him. Maybe he just didn't want to kill everybody. Maybe he felt bad about it. God took it so seriously that this old man Samuel, 
This old man Samuel goes up to Saul, finds out they didn't kill everybody, and this old man grabs a sword It says he hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord. Yeah, right. That's how serious God took it. Yeah. If he had to have, have this prophet go and cut him in pieces right then and there, he was going to do it. That's how seriously God took this. He wanted everything gone, everybody dead. Because you say, well, that's mean. Well, look what happened when they didn't. What happened when they didn't? What happened when they started, you know, living, dwelling with them and, and just taking people captive? They became like them. They fell into sin, right? So it makes perfect sense why God said that. Uh, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are few. So they, they have even more faith. They're, they have so much faith, they say, you know what, we don't even need. God, God will take care of us. We don't even need the whole army. Let's just send you know, a, a small portion of people up. And you know, this is a time when they're strong in their faith. So they, they went up thither, verse 4, they went up thither, the people about 3,000, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them down from before the gate, even unto Sheb Shebarim, and smote them into going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. I mean, to put, them, put, put yourself in their shoes. Here you're going into this land, you're going in faith. You're, you're going in faith that God's going to give you the victory. They went, they went to Jericho, and they, God gave them this great victory. I'm sure they're very strong in their faith. Like I said, they're even so strong in their faith that they didn't even send the whole army to Ai. They, they, they were so strong in their faith, they, they just sent a, just a, a smaller portion of people up, and like the people die, and they lose. I'm sure it makes sense, which is the, the, their, how, their heart melted and became as water. I'm sure they're like, what's going on? God had just got done telling them, you know, that famous verse that people put in their refrigerator, be strong and have a good for courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That's this mentality that they had, and, and 36 people died. In Joshua, verse 6, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide he and the elders of the people, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan, to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelled on the other side of Jordan. He, he's saying, you know, we, we, we would rather just, you know, stay in the wilderness than come over here and, just, and, and be disappointed and, and, and lose to all these nations. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall he hear of it, and shall envy us round about, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So this was a result of someone's sin. Skip down to verse 18. Basically what God ends up doing in these verses that we went over, or skipped, is God basically... Uh, picks who it was. He, he shows them who it was that sinned. Verse 18, And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Camri, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, the glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Saying, what have you done? What, what did you do to, you know, that, that was so bad it caused all these people to die? And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, notice this phrase, okay, because this shows a fundamental misunderstanding that this man had about what he did. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And what he did not understand here is that, yes, maybe it was just you that sinned, but that doesn't, your sin does not just stop with you. Other people will be punished, or not be punished, but to face those consequences of your sin. Here's what he did. Verse 21, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, the fifty shekels weight, 
Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, in the silver under it. So when they invaded Jericho in the previous chapter, like I said, they were to keep nothing. They were to destroy everybody, everything. But he, he was covetous. He, he took some gold, some treasure for himself. Uh, verse 22, so, God's, or so, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran it unto the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent in the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them into Joshua, into all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? See, Achan said, I have sinned. But Joshua said, No, you've troubled us. You haven't just troubled yourself. You're not the only one who's going to be punished for your sin. Your sin affects others as well. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley Achor unto this day. In this story, one man messed up. But 36 people faced the consequences of that. I mean, how many people do you think lost their, their dad or lost their husband or lost their their brother or lost their son just because of one man who messed up. And that's, that's how it goes. And there's tons of stories in the Bible. We don't have time to look at all of them, but tons of stories where one person messing up affects generations of people. Yep. Turn to 1 Chronicles 21. We'll look at one more. This is a story of the David. There's, there's a few that are with David, but this is just one. 1 Chronicles 21. So the context of the story is David basically counted the people. And it may not seem like a big deal at first, but numbering the people was something that was only to be done when God said so. I mean, they weren't supposed to go into a battle with the assurance of how many people they had or how, how physically strong they were. They were supposed to go into battle knowing that God was with them, right? And there were times when God did count the people, but it was, it was supposed to be when God said so, not when people just wanted to do it out of a lack of faith. And David knew he wasn't supposed to. And if you read the story, ironically, Joab, who's normally a pretty bad person, was actually right about it. And Joab didn't even count all the people because he knew it was wrong. And then in 1 Chronicles 21, look at verse 8. And this is after David realizes what he's done and how he sinned. And David said unto God, notice this, we see the same misunderstanding that Achan had with David. I have sinned greatly. Because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So, so Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, choose thee. So he, God gives him options on what punishment he wants. Either three years famine, or three years months to be destroyed before, before thy foes, well, that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying through all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, and don't get me wrong, I love this phrase that he says. This is actually one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. He says, I am in a great strait, but let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hands of man. I love this phrase because it shows that how, uh, this understanding David had of God's mercy. He says, you know what? There is no man that, that will be as merciful to me as God will be merciful. So that's why he said, you know what? Let me just, like, I pray God would just punish me because you know what? God pardons and God is merciful. But you still see the misunderstanding. Look what he said. Let me fall. But let, not, but let me not fall in the hand of man. David had this understanding that it was just a punishment that was going to come upon him. And I don't think he really like processed this in his mind that it's going to affect a lot more people than you, David. It's not just you, David. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. I think sometimes, kind of like my dad was talking about this morning, we read these numbers in the Bible and we kind of just, you know, skip over it with 70,000 men. 70,000 men is a lot of people. Yeah. And God, this, these are the people. It wasn't just David. 
that was punished for his sin, 70, you know what, David didn't even lose his life. David's life was, was David still lived. But 70,000 people died because of David's sin, who had done no wrong. And, the, and God sent an angel into Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, David was right about God's mercy. And he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a sword drawn in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And in verse 17, you kind of see it click in his mind where he understands I'm not the only one who really was and being punished for this. I'm not the one. I'm, I, I got off the hook on this one. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Now, see, now he has the right mentality. Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. What David didn't understand until now was your sin doesn't just stop with you. It doesn't just affect you. Don't be like David. Don't be like Achan. Don't be like a whole lot of other people in the Bible who had to learn this the hard way. Turn, this to, turn to Ecclesiastes 12. So first tonight I said the curse's cause may be testing from God. Maybe God's testing you. That's what the hard times in your life are. are that's, what, that's the cause of them. Maybe the curse's cause is God chastising you or correcting you. Maybe the curse's cause is, your, is the effect of somebody else's sin. And that's kind of more just a reminder that our sin affects others, right? But before I end tonight, I want to answer, answer this question. What do we do once we know the curse's cause, right? I don't know the curse's cause in your life. Only, you know, all, all I can do is show you what the Bible says and you and the Holy Spirit can figure that out on your own. But once you figure it out, once you say, okay, I think... God's, God's uh, correcting me. I think God's just testing me right now in my life. What do you do once you know that? Later in Ecclesiastes 12, it says this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What should I do if God is testing me? Fear God, keep his commandments. Keep fearing God, keep serving God, keep doing his commandments. Amen. That's, what, that's what God wants from you. What, I, what should I do if God is chastising me? Better start fearing God and keeping his, his commandments. It's all the same. It's all the same, right? Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 7, 9, I love this verse, says, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins. It says he trieth the hearts and reins. If you, if you get on a horse and you're trying the reins, you're pulling the reins, it's because you want a reaction from it, right? If you, pull, if you pull back on the reins, you want the horse to stop or to go back. If you're pulling to the left, you want it to turn its head this way and go this way. If you're pulling to the right, or your, your guys is right, you, it, it's because you want a reaction from, from the horse, right? And in the same way, when God is trying your heart, when the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins, it's because he is looking for a certain reaction from you. He wants, he wants an action from you. And like I said, I don't know the curses caused in your life. All I can do is just show you what the Bible says, and you and the Holy Spirit can figure that out on your own. But I do know this, what, whatever the reason is, and I hope you know, the sermon kind of helped you figure it out, but whatever the reason is, it's because God wants a reaction from you, right? Good. And, you know, the, the worst thing we can do the worst possible thing we can do when things go wrong, when things get bad, when the curse that is not causeless comes in our life, the worst possible thing we can do is to stick our head in the sand and refuse to look at why. Because as Christians, when things happen in our life, there's a reason, right? It's the curse causeless shall not come. A curse will not come in your life without a reason. And we kind of talked about this earlier, but at the end of the day, if, we, if you remember, we, we read Nehemiah, right? At the end of the day, God just wants to bless you. God wants the best for you. He wants you to live a successful, happy life. But we need to consider the curse of the, 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 the curse's cause in our life so we can give God the reaction that he wants from us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for um, this verse, God, in Proverbs.
a, a small verse, but with a lot of truth in it. Um, thank you for just this principle, God, that you don't send curses upon our life without a reason. There's a reason you, you allow these things to happen. There's a, there's, a res, there's a response you want from us. I pray you'd help us, God, when things go wrong or even if things in the future go wrong, we just keep this in mind that there's a reason for the curses in our life and that at the end of the day, we, you just want the reaction that you ask of us, God. I pray you would bless this church, God. I pray you would bless the fellowship to come, God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.